All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. This is Common Ground. And the title of today's talk is Tours Effective and Scalable Vulnerability Management by Yotam Perkel. Before we get started, I would like to make some announcements. First of all, we would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, SEMGrab, Lookat, Flextrack, Toyota, Conductor One. It's their support that, uh, along with other sponsors and donors, and our volunteers that this that makes this event possible. Also, I would request everyone to uh, switch uh, your phones in silent mode because this is streamed online. And it, we'll have a Q&A towards the end of every talk. So you can use the mic. I'll be walking around with the, the mic. And with that, let's get jump right into it. Please welcome our speaker, Yotam Perka. Over to you. So hi, everyone. Um, very excited to be here. Um, before we start, just to get a sense of the crowd, um, I would love to get a show of hands. Who here directly deals with vulnerability management as part of their day job? OK, very good. And who knows, maybe doesn't uh, directly um, work with vulnerability management, but know how its organization uh, prioritizes vulnerabilities? Okay, a few more. So, and out of all those hands, uh, how many of your organizations rely either solely on CVSS score or primarily on CVSS score to do vulnerability prioritization? Okay, so, great. Um, okay, uh, a few other questions. So, who here uh, has heard of VEX? The show of hands. Okay, CSAF. Okay. Uh, EPSS. Okay, so so that's good. So there, there are a lot of topics to cover, and uh, this talk was originally supposed to be 45 minutes. Uh, it got trimmed to 20. So I apologize in advance if I'll rush some of the pieces. I have a lot of links at the end, so you can uh, dive further. Uh, and also, I'm around the conference. Feel free to to approach me with questions, and uh, I can talk about this topic for hours. But today, I'll hold it to 20 minutes. So. Um, Let's start. So I'm Yotam. I currently lead uh, vulnerability management at a startup called Resilient. Uh, prior to that, I worked at PayPal doing threat intelligence, uh, insider threat, uh, and vulnerability management uh, research. Uh, I also take part in several OpenSSF uh, working groups around open source security uh, and CISA work groups around SBOM and VEX. Uh, and organized the uh, PyCon IL, one of the organizers of the PyCon IL conference. Okay, so uh, the reason you see an iceberg here isn't because we're going to talk about climate change or global warming. Uh, this kind of reflects the way we're standing, the way we're at with uh, software uh, supply chain. Uh, currently, most code in your production environment isn't code that you wrote. Uh, we use third-party code, whether it's open source or commercial, and that's good. It allows us to move fast. It allows us to focus on our core uh, business logic. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it also comes with risk. And one of those risks is uh, in the form of, of uh, vulnerabilities, uh, non-vulnerabilities. As and as you can see here, uh, the amount of vulnerability is constantly rising. Uh, this is up to August 2023. You can, also, you can already see that we're 2,000-ish uh, vulnerabilities over what we were at in terms of the publish rate uh, last year, and this isn't something that is going to change anytime soon. Um, and um, exploitation of known vulnerabilities still is the, one of the major factors, uh, attack vectors for uh, initial access to organizations. And um, organizations simply uh, don't seem to keep up and be able to remediate or patch uh, all of these uh, vulnerabilities. So, what do we normally do about it? So, we turn to CVSS. Um, and the thing with CVSS is that it's not, uh, it's suboptimal, uh, I would say. It's not effective, it's not scalable, uh, and it doesn't even reflect actual risk. Um, and I'll explain. So it isn't scalable. I say that because around 57% of all of the vulnerabilities with CVSS risk score in NVD 
our CVSS, uh, our high and critical vulnerabilities. So even if you do prioritize and focus only on the hides and the crits, it's not, it's still 57% of, of NVD that we're talking about hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities. It's not scalable. Um, it's also not effective. Uh, the reality is that only a fraction of vulnerabilities will ever be exploited. Uh, and only a fraction of those are, are actually exploitable in the context of specific environments. So when you focus your time uh, on vulnerabilities that are not likely to be exploited or will never be exploited, you're wasting your valuable and limited resources as is on, uh, on the wrong things. Um, and uh, attackers are already a step ahead because they don't rely on CVSS scores in order to determine which vulnerabilities to exploit. Um, so, um, again, it's not, it's not an effective thing to do. Um, and moreover, it's not really a smart thing to do as well. Um, so, pause here. Yeah, so as I said, uh, it's not that attackers only exploit high and critical vulnerabilities. Uh, this quote is actually from the folks who uh, are in the uh, CVSS working group who, in, who invented the standard. And they strictly mention and say that it's only a measure of technical severity. It's not recommended to use CVSS base score alone to determine remediation priority. Um, but uh, that is the current status quo. So clearly this isn't working. Um, we have uh, about 16% of vulnerabilities according to research from Cynthia Institute that are left unattended for over a year after the initial publications. Uh, as I said, huge backlogs of vulnerabilities and uh, attackers exploit these vulnerabilities. This is from research we did analyzing the public attack surface for the CISA CAF catalog, the known exploited vulnerability uh, catalog. And, um, and as you can see, there are millions, literally millions of instances publicly facing that are uh, vulnerable to these actively exploited with known patches, vulnerabilities. Um, but that, that's, that's, the, that's the reality. And, and a lot of these are, are also not new vulnerabilities, as you can see. Um, so how can we move forward, what's, what's the road uh, going forward? And also something I didn't mention, the average organization only has a capacity to uh, deal with 10% of their uh, vulnerability backlog in a given month, also from Cynthia Institute. So we need focus. Uh, and what can give us uh, focus? Uh, context. So this uh, blob you see here will slightly get more focused as hopefully as the talk progresses. Um, and I'll, I'll try to describe a few um, aspects of this context. So. First of all, um, the initial kind of base level of context is a software bill of materials or an S-bomb. This is not the topic of my talk. Also, feel free to approach me later. Uh, and it allows us to know exactly what we have in our environment without memorizing or guessing, which is great because it, um, at least we know what we have. But even if we have the perfect S-bomb, which most organizations unfortunately still don't have, and all of the different uh, aspects that are still being worked on are in place, is the problem solved? So I argue that no, unfortunately, because actually the opposite is true because we know more. And when we know more, we have more things to deal with, which is good, but again, this isn't something that the current, the average organization has the capacity to handle. Um, so it isn't a silver bullet and we need more, uh, more context. So, context. So there are several layers. As I said, SBOM is, is kind of the, the base level of context, but you can add on top of that additional layers of context. For example, exploitability. You have things like EPSS score, which is, I won't go into that because again, a shorter of time, but it's a, a, a machine learning model that lets you predict the likelihood of exploitability within the next 30 days. We have a research on that. It's, it's, it's a very strong signal for prioritization. The CISA-CAV non-exploited vulnerability catalog of various threat intel feeds. 
Uh, the vulnerability itself also provides context. The attack vector, is it exploited via the network, only physical? Are our privileges required? Do you need authentication to exploit it, etc.? cetera? Uh, environmental context, so do you have mitigation, con mitigating control in place? Uh, do you have reachability analysis? Is this code even being loaded, even used? Uh, and of course, business context. Is it, uh, what's the asset criticality? Is it exposed uh, or internal, etc.? But again, this is nice, it's good but it's not really actionable because in order for it to be actionable uh, we need automation and uh, in order for it to scale so um, this is the current how do we do about how do we uh, go about answering am i affected today so we can run a vulnerability scan but again uh, noisy um, and uh, this is also a shameless plug. I have a talk about that specific topic later today uh, at 6 at the breaking ground, but um, uh, not always reliable um, and a lot of things to deal with. Independent investigation, uh, time consuming, not effective as the vendor as well, not scalable. Security advisories, nice, but uh, not always will have those and also not something that we can currently automate. And SBOM, uh, as I mentioned, not everyone has it and it's not alone. Uh, it's not the cure. So this is where CSAF comes in. Uh, CSAF is, is the Common Security Advisory Framework. Um, and basically, you can think of it, uh, and, um, you can think of it as a machine-readable security advisory. So you have, for example, in this case, uh, Cisco issuing a, a security advisory. Currently, it can be in HTML format. It can be in a text format. It can be in a PDF. Uh, you don't really know where it's at. Uh, and it's not something that you can uh, automate consumption of. CSAF tries to solve that, that, uh, that issue. Um, and it's easily discoverable uh, via several methods. In this case, we see a security TXT file, or, or try to see. I'll try to highlight it a bit. Um, so we have uh, the security TXT file with the reference to where can, I, where can I consume that CSAF from. And then the CSAF itself uh, is the, the bottom link uh, which is basically a JSON file with the same security advisories that we saw before, only in a machine-readable uh, format that allows for automation. Um, so this is how it uh, looks like, and, and you see there's various la layers and, and uh, pieces of metadata that can go into the, such a CSAF, but the main thing to remember about this is that, again, it's machine-readable, it can be automated, and you can, you can start to consume it, and Cisco is doing a great job uh, of, of advocating for it. There was recently a summit, um, and there, 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 I hope this will get more traction uh, as time goes by. Uh, so that's one, and so we can, we can see the picture a bit more clearly now, but uh, another important piece of the puzzle is VEX. Uh, VEX, the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. Um, as Alan uh, often uh, feels sorry for the name, but that's the name and we'll leave it. Uh, so, um, basically this is a way to communicate whether a piece of software is affected by a specific vulnerability. So, um, I'll read the quotes, I'll provide users additional information on whether a product is impacted by specific vulnerability in an including component, and if affected, whether there are actions recommended to remediate. So that's the purpose. Again, machine-readable way to, for your uh, vendor to say, this product is not affected by vulnerability X. Uh, also, it has the uh, ability to say if something is affected. Uh, we'll discuss that shortly. Um, and again, aims to be machine readable. You can embed that in, as a profile in CSAF that we mentioned before. Uh, so all of the pieces of the puzzle come together. It can be linked to an SBOM, it can be uh, separate. Um, and it allows us to handle this, this issue of false positives um, from, in a more scalable way. Um, and from a vendor perspective, it saves them money because you don't have to have your uh, phone centers crash whenever something uh, major comes up. And I think the, the promising direction for it is also from the consumer side. So if I, as a consumer, have a product uh, that can tell me whether something is impacted by a specific vulnerability because it's not loaded, because the configuration is in place, and it can issue a VEX for me, again, then I'll have this, this, this language, automated language that I can help to reduce my attack surface. So, uh, sorry I'm rushing, I want to get to the core part, which is 
in a few slides. Uh, and again, there are several statuses for VEX. You can say something isn't affected, affected, fixed, or under investigation. Uh, and obviously, this is dynamic. It can change over time. Um, and because it's machine readable, that's not really an issue. Um, okay, so, uh, and there are several justifications. Those are the current ones. I'll give an example just for context. Let's say a vulnerable code not present. So if you remember log for shell, five minutes, okay. Five minutes, I'm good. Uh, so log for shell. Uh, so one of the remediation advice that were that was provided that was to remove the vulnerable class from the jar file, uh, the GNDI lookup class. Um, so if you remove that class, you still have the vulnerable jar in the vulnerable version. Your scanner would say you're affected, but you're not really affected. So if you have this vex, you can update this status and let your, your security tooling, your uh, insider threat personnel, your whatever organization, and if you're a supplier, then to the folks that consume your software, that you're not affected by that specific vulnerability. And there are several other justifications. Um, so it's, it's really uh, a flexible uh, format. Okay, so now I'll try to put all of these pieces together uh, and see, um, so as you can see, we can already see the picture clearer. Um, so this is something that, again, I won't go too deep into the stakeholder specific vulnerability categorization or SSVC. There are links at the end of the presentation, but you can think of it as a decision tree. You have a decision tree that allows you to decide what to do, uh, in various circumstances or situation regarding a specific vulnerability. And I know you can't see well, so I'll try to, to, uh, give some context. So. There are three actions that you can take. Uh, this, uh, I, I stuck with the CISA um, approach for this one, but this is very flexible. Uh, just for the sake of the example, we say act is patch, remediate, attend to now. Attend is, okay, I know I need to fix this, but I'll first deal with the act and get to this and crack. So currently it's not something that I'm uh, actively doing something about, but I'm, I'm keeping track. So. And here you see, for example, three layers of context, exploitability context. So you have EPSS, CISAC, have threat intel to tell you whether the vulnerability is actively exploited. This branch, the middle branch, is uh, highly likely to be exploited or uh, not likely on the right-hand side. And then you have another uh, layer of decision, which is the asset context that we, uh, uh, sorry, the automatable, which is from the vulnerability. So if the vulnerability is uh, exploitable via the network and also doesn't require privileged or authentication, that in, then it's automatable and then it's in a higher risk from my perspective. And then I, I, I send it to a different branch of the tree. And then we have the asset context. So how critical is this asset, low, medium, or high? And then I make a decision. So if, for example, I have a vulnerability that is actively exploited and automatable and um, on a critical asset, obviously I need to act upon it. And again, the decision here is, is in the focus. Like, you can, we can debate the decision, it's not the purpose. But um, the thing is, you, you have this thing that you can communicate internally and to stakeholders and say, this is how we do things now, according to these, this, these, these parameters. And you can tune that according to your capacity of the organization. So you know you can only deal with 10% of the vulnerabilities. Make sure that that's the 10% that actually count, that matter most. And you can, let's say, okay, I don't have an asset criticality. That's not a problem, it's flexible. So I, I, I chopped off the, the last layer of the tree and I added, for example, I have a, a, a product, a vendor that can tell me whether something is loaded or not, do reachability analysis. So maybe that's my uh, first deci decision that, uh, that I wanna take after I know if something is, uh, what's the likelihood of exploitation. Um, and uh, maybe I wanna, I have all these things and I can put everything together and I get a lot more context. So, and then I can make more educated um, um, assumption and prioritization to focus on what actually matters. And you can look at it as like a funnel. Okay, so you have your vulnerability scanner output, and then you have what we talked about, the CISA and VEX that tells you wh what, uh, what you should focus on, what, what affected and what isn't. And then you have this decision tree with all this context that filters that out. And then you start from the bottom. You start working with what's uh, 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 most critical in terms of risk reduction to your organization and work your way up. Okay, so um, this the, the blob that you saw in this picture is from a movie called The Truman Show, which is about a man that lives his whole life as a, in a scene of a movie, but he doesn't realize that. And 
the quote is when they ask the director um, uh, what, uh, uh, how, does it, how does it not suspect? And he said, we accept the reality of the world which we are presented. Uh, and so what I ask of you is don't accept the reality of the world as you are presented um, and, and be inquisitive and, and uh, know that there are these resources out there um, and uh, transform your vulnerability management program into a more modern uh, risk-based vulnerability management program. Um, so that's it. No time for questions. I'm sorry. So in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Also from the Truman Show. Thank you all for listening. Yes, what? Yes, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll leave that up. There is also a great presentation from B-Sides Dublin, uh, which isn't here on YouTube, uh, also about SSVC, which is a great resource um, for you guys. Yes. And again, I'm here. Meet up at 12.30 on the registration desk in a piazza.